we go. Welcome back. Episode 177 of Chaotically Autonomous. We got a big guest here. I'm really excited for this one. Griffin Proc. Is that correct? That is correct. I always thought it was maybe like your middle name was P and then your last name was Rock. So I would always just in my head, I would be like Griffin P Rock. Uh, but it's <laughs> Griffin Proc here. Big guy on threads. We, we met over threads and he's just Seems like a pretty cool guy. I um, wanted to have him on. He does uh, it's it's show about sports. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That is correct. Yeah. So we're going to get all of his thoughts and my thoughts on the week three games and who we think is going to win in week four. Uh, we do. We are recording during the Monday night games, um, which we will talk a little bit about Monday night and how I hate the dual Monday night game starting within like an hour and a half of each other. It's stupid. Agreed. But make sure to like, comment, subscribe, go over to the show about sports. Are you guys on YouTube as well? So no, I'm only on a uh, podcast. So you go to Apple or Spotify. That's where I'm at. But a lot of people have told me I got to dabble in YouTube. So that might be coming around the corner. <laughs> all right. Well, let's, let's try and push him to get it. Um, go let's check him out on, on all those stuff. Go follow him, go follow us and uh, let's go. Let's do it. All right. Let's 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 do this thing. Where do we want to start? I, I want to start with you first. Thank you for coming on. I'm very excited mm -hmm. for this. Um, you are a Seahawks fan. So ha where, where are we gauging the Seahawks? Mike McDonald, obviously, brand new head coach. Where are we gauging them right now? It's a great question, and it's a great team to start off with because I think what we've seen through three weeks is we're seeing a lot of pretenders and contender conversations come up. I'm doing types of threads like that. I'm having conversations with people online, and you can tell that a lot of people are feeling one way or another. Nobody has a consensus on any team, and the Seahawks are one of those teams. We're 3-0, and but when you look at who we've beaten so far, I like to be a realist. I'm not a homer. I like to be more of a national kind of guy on threads, so I'm not like, oh, Seahawks this, Seahawks that, we're going to win. I thought maybe best case second place competing with the Rams would be our season outlook. But we beat the Broncos, barely beat the Patriots, and then we stomped over the Dolphins, as we should have. I mean, we were playing third string Tim Boyle at one point because we hurt Skylar Thompson. I mean, that curse in Miami is tough for the quarterback. Yeah. So it's kind of a, an expectation setting uh, time period for Seahawks fans. It's easy to get very excited, and there are a lot of things that are great. Our defense was essentially 32nd in the league last year, and now we're you know, dabbling into the top 15 through these first three weeks. Geno Smith's one of the most efficient quarterbacks. A lot of people don't like to give him credit. He has the highest completion percentage out of any quarterback that has played the first three games. That's what you like to see, and he's throwing it a ton in this new offense led by Ryan Grubb. So I'm loving the new era. I don't want to get too high on it yet, but 49ers are banged up. Rams are banged up, but the Cardinals are looking a little spicy, so they might come and surprise some heads too in the NFC West. Yeah, the cards, it's something I'm, I'm very much of the emotions guy. I, we have some people on the show that come on. They're very statistics. I'm like, oh, I look at the Cardinals logo. That It's just it doesn't do it for me. I'm like, they're, they're going to be horrible every single year, but they've, they've been frisky. They're, they're the definition of frisky. I think, yeah. especially, you know, playing Buffalo tough and um, they, they, who did they play this week? I, I could have sworn they're playing the Rams this week and I was watching no, yeah, the highlights yeah. and, and I thought they blew a big lead. Um, they, oh, the Lions, they, they put up yeah. a little good, bit of a fight with, uh, with Detroit. And they um, were in that. Detroit has shown weakness all year so far. I mean, they've had to go through some tough opponents. You think about the Rams, that emotional victory in the week one. The Buccaneers in week two had their number. I mean, they've essentially played their two playoff teams the, the first two weeks. Talk about a re-entry into a team that's like, we want to win the Super Bowl. Well, here's your first test. And then you're right. Kyler Murray, you know, and whatnot. It was a close game. But the Lions looked more efficient than what that score shows of 20 to 13. But I'm with yeah. you on that. I don't want to play the Cardinals. But I agree that their bird logo logo is second to the Seahawks <laughs> in terms of – and the Eagles as well. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the birds. The uh, I don't I don't remember what the birds were. I think like at week three they were five hundred or something. All the bird teams were five hundred. I love those are the only stats I really ever care about. I just love mm -hmm. those stupid, stupid stats. Um, but let's let's just dive in to everything. So we haven't uh, gotten to talk about Aaron Rodgers and the Jets picking up a win. The Patriots finally that curse might be over. That's the first time they've won two in a row against the Patriots since two thousand eight and two thousand nine. And, you know, I'm just waiting for the Jets to uh, hit Aaron Rodgers like a 
like a train. Yeah. That that Jets curse, it's going to hit him. I have a strong feeling it's going to hit him. I unfortunately feel the same way, just more on his age. I mean, he does look a lot more mobile than Kirk Cousins, so we have to give him credit for that. He was doing something right this offseason with the doctors there. But it's just do you rely on the oldest player in the NFL to take you all the way? We've only seen one quarterback really do that, and that's Tom Brady, the greatest of all time, really do that. And I'm not discounting Aaron Rodgers because when we saw that game, he picked apart the Patriots. I mean, oh, yeah. that was exactly what you want to see from Aaron Rodgers at his age. Now, can they get the run game going efficiently enough? That's still to be able to see. The defense was great, in my opinion, in that game. And a lot of people discounted the Patriots. They're like, well, the Patriots are terrible. Well, can we remember that the Patriots beat the Bengals and then took the Seahawks to overtime? I think we're yeah. discrediting the Patriots and what they've put together. The vibes are a lot better there for a one and two team compared to the Carolina Panthers, even though their vibes are getting a little bit better after week three with Andy Dalton. So I don't know. The Jets are frisky. I mean, I think I put them at second place in that division uh, when I predicted. And I think Aaron Rodgers still got a little bit left in the tank. Well, yeah, uh, Tua going down kind of washed everything for me i i really felt like it was miami i felt buffalo was kind of going into this semi rebuild this weird thing where yes josh allen's still there so you're always going to compete but you don't have the weapons but they've i mean he hasn't missed a beat um, but we'll talk about that later i don't want to get too much into that i i agree with you i don't like discounting this patriots team i mean you look at how they were defensively last year they've i mean they they did lose a big piece but it doesn't they they have a defensive coordinator as their head coach that it only makes too much sense to me they played really tough um on defense past couple weeks i feel like i i do think there is something to primetime games weird early games um especially for like these younger teams because this is a young patriots team now like we haven't really seen a young patriots team you know since i mean it's early tom brady i feel like it's been a long time um and defensively, they, I mean, yeah, Rodgers looks like he's still got it. He's got some zip on that football still. The old man's got it. <laughs> he's got the best looking throw I've seen. Oh, like, he's just, it's a sidearm. It's a little, like, everybody says a little Patrick Mahomey, but also Tom Brady, where it's just so flawless with the arm. So, and you yeah. can literally just see his wrist, like, flick it. And the he's ball one just of those. Comes off. Somebody said this in a different podcast, so it's not my original thought, but he's one of the few court. They said it about CJ, CJ Stroud. But I think of this as Aaron Rodgers. When we're just looking at the plain view, the 11-man view, not the all-22 view, he's one of the yeah. few quarterbacks that when he releases the ball, I have trust it's going where it's supposed to go because it just yeah. looks so confident in where it's going. So when the camera pans and there's a wide-open Garrett Wilson, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense that Aaron Rodgers threw it like that. So he's one of those quarterbacks where I'm just like, if he's throwing it, I'm confident it's going somewhere good. Yeah, I think even as he's aged and the way he he has, you know, obviously hasn't been able to move like he does 10 years ago, I think it looks better because yeah. you're able to zero in more on him rather than him running around. Like you can really break apart his mechanics, his throwing mechanics, because he doesn't have that mobility as much. And it just makes it look so much sexier. So Sorry, Aaron. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how you feel about that if you're listening, uh, but it's sexy. <laughs> you know um, he loves it. You know he loves it. <laughs> oh, he, oh, he's a... I'm not going to say what I was going to say, but he, he <laughs> loves the attention. He loves yeah. it. Um, yeah. Now, who do you think? I, I think there is a bit of a battle right now for who's going to be that number one offensive weapon. And, and obviously Garrett Wilson is the initial thought, but you haven't seen it as much. I, I feel like they've been kind of trying to co trying to get comfortable with each other. Um, who do you think is going to be that next big weapon for him? Is it still it's Wilson a great or question. is taking his spot? It's a great question because actually when I was watching the game, they brought up a highlight in the first like quarter or two that he got nine offensive skill players involved in the first like 20 throws. Like that's incredible. We don't usually see that in the NFL. I don't have a specific stat that says that doesn't happen very often, but I can guarantee you it doesn't happen that often. So I have to go with a guy like Lazard. If it's not Wilson, it's Lazard because that's just his buddy. You know, he's comfortable with him. Lazard's running very specific route concepts. You think of him as like the Gabe Davis of the Jets where he's either going deep or he's that immediate, like, I'm your safety here. You know what I mean? I'm not doing anything complicated. Garrett Wilson's kind of that gadget guy where they can do a little bit more, which leads to if it doesn't work out, they're going to look somewhere else. I still think Garrett Wilson's the number one option, but look out for kind of Lazard to be sneaky successful, especially if Mike Williams is still, you know, slow off that uh, ACL, I should say, uh, as he gets up to speed here. 
Yeah, eight different players had two yeah. or more receptions. Yeah, pretty crazy. Crazy. Pretty crazy. And they ran the ball for 133 yards too. Like you just <laughs> you you just have you can leave that one out. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. No, totally. Um, to the yeah, let's go to the Giants and Browns. Let's do it. Gro- I mean, this was a gross game when we were talking about it last week. I still feel like it was pretty gross, but Danny Dimes just finds a way. I mean, he finds a way for the first time this year, and for the first time <laughs> since his ACL injury, unfortunately. And I'm not a hater of Daniel Jones. I think it was unfortunate where he was drafted. It's kind of like the Zach Wilson effect. Like, if mm-hmm. I don't think there's draft busts all the time. I think it's a team just – overstepped to get a guy that they were way too high on. Everybody, when we look back, is going to be like, Danny Dimes shouldn't have been taken that high. That's just, there's seven different backups. He, he that came are from a high. basketball school like that. Exactly. I could have told you that on draft night. <laughs> exactly. So get ready because Riley Leonard next year, he, he came from Duke, went to Notre Dame. He's going to get the same kind of attention where he's like of that mold. I'm telling you right now, do not overdraft that kid. He's not bad. He just, he reminds me of that kind of, we get we fall in love with weird things. But Danny Dimes, just to give him credit, I mean, 24 of 34, 236 yards, two touchdowns, over 100 passer rating. I'm going to be honest, that's probably the first over 100 passer rating in a while for him, if I had to guess. And they finally unlocked that neighbor's connection that we were looking for. I know it was early. It was only three weeks into the season. But we finally found that connection that he needs at a true wide receiver one. So I loved what I saw for the Giants, especially barring their expectations. Yeah, I'm trying to pull up his uh, his game log here. I want to see the last last one he had because it had to have gone – I did he even have one in 23? I feel like it was 22 was probably the last one he would have had. It's, it's got to be. Uh, passer rating. So the final game against Indianapolis in 20, 22 season 23 uh, was the year. He had a 125.2 passer rating. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let me just see if he had any in 23. He played, what, two, two, three games in 23? Ooh, yeah, it was pretty quick for him, unfortunately. The comeback right against Arizona was his last 100 passer, passer rating. Yeah. That was the largest comeback in Giants history, and it was like 21 points. <laughs> there you go. There you see, that when you say it like that, that, that kind of sets the precedent a little bit more, you know, on Danny Dimes, so... Yeah, I don't know. I, I want to stay away from the Deshaun Watson off the field issues because it's Fair. just it, I think it's been rehashed too many times. We don't have any information about what's going on. I mean, what what are you supposed to do here? The, <laughs> what do you think? What would you do yeah. if you're in Cleveland, if you're Kevin okay. Costner in draft day and you somehow <laughs> got Deshaun Watson? <laughs> what are you doing here? Because it's, there's a no win situation. People are probably not going to love the answer that are Browns fans, but I think it's time to try out who else is on the on the bench. I mean, Jameis Winston, for all his glory and for all of the things on his downside, he might be just a fresh perspective. We saw that with the Browns last year. They tried everybody out since Watson. And sometimes that's all you need. Go ask the Carolina Panthers right now if they enjoyed that Andy Dalton game this week. They probably did because that was awesome for them. And so... Here's my problem. There's also a philosophy at place that I don't really understand. They only ran the ball 18 times as a team against the New York Giants, and they were only down a little bit that whole game, 21 to 15. And they had Deshaun Watson throwing the ball 37 times. I don't know if I like that split as a team overall. That's and some not of those runs. No, it's not. And Deshaun Watson even ran four of those times. So if you're thinking about it, only 14 carries to Jerome Ford, who I think is a very serviceable running back in today's NFL. And I'm only saying that partially because he's on my fantasy team. So use him a little bit more Browns. But (laughs) you know what I mean? I just feel like the formula and philosophy isn't Browns related. Usually they run the ball. Nick Chubb ran the hell out of the ball, at least 20 carries a game. And so I don't know what's going on. I think Kevin Stefanski is in a weird spot, doesn't know what to do, maybe getting a lot of pressure from upstairs on we can't bench our $230 million yeah. quarterback. But, I mean, what's the long-term play? He's He has to be in one of the most frustrating situations, I think, for a head coach because you have this incredibly expensive quarterback and you, you have no option. I mean, the poor guy... Like, I can't even blame him. It's like they, they're probably telling him, you need to throw the ball 30 times with Watson. A- mm-hmm. Any any self-respecting head coach who's the offensive play caller would run the ball 40 times if they had this Deshaun Watson as their quarterback. 
hundred percent. And they have options out there to throw the ball to. That's not really the problem. Yeah, yeah. David DeJoke has been a little banged up, but their defense, like every good defense, there is going to be a step back. They're not the same defense as last year so far. Miles Garrett has already reported that he has injuries in both of his feet. That he's like, I'm going to get surgery after the season. <laughs> but tell me he's going to get surgery after the season, after a couple more losses. He might speed that up to take care of himself because he's in, yeah. in line for another big payday soon. So I don't, I just think things are going to start to crumble in Cleveland. And that's why I predicted them to be, unfortunately, fourth in the division, even with the Watson upside that people still think is there. Yeah. Um, Packers, Titans. Malik Willis comes in, gets his revenge over the Titans. Um, he, the guy is just consistent. He doesn't lose you games. And I think it's honestly more of a testament to the coaching, um, and, and to Matt LaFleur. I think he's a great, I think Matt LaFleur is a great coach, even with love. And you can just tell the way that he calls plays for Willis. He's not putting any sort of pressure. The, the, and at the end of the half of the Colts game last week, they could have tried to drive down the field the end of half, but he was like, no, we're not going to put pressure on the kid. We're, we're going to just kneel this one out go to half and obviously they won. Um, but Malik Willis looked great. Will Levis is doing Will Levis things. That's all I can say. Yeah, no, I'm completely with you on all of that. And I think what's interesting and sorry to bang on the Colts here a little bit, but I think oh, Malik I'll Willis, bang on him. Trust you me. know what I mean? Like I think Malik Willis is showing and the Green Bay Packers are showing Anthony Richardson and Shane Steichen you don't need to overcomplicate it. Sometimes this is all you need to do. But the big but is that the defense is great in, in Green Bay. It's not getting enough credit. Yeah, they haven't played the craziest teams yet. Against the Eagles, it was kind of sloppy out the gate. But against the Titans, they just destroyed them so that they could run the ball 37 times against the Titans. Yeah. You don't get to run the ball 37 times if you're not up 30 to 14. So that's a big difference there. But when we talk about it, quarterback said, don't throw the ball a lot. Don't get put in a lot of mistakes. There is kind of this narrative building with Anthony Richardson that I'm also a part of where I'm just like, I, I'm, I'm worried what Shane's asking him to do. And maybe we need to simplify it a little bit, kind of like what Malik Willis is doing. here. Yeah. Um, so Malik Willis had, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven players with a reception in this yeah. game. So they're clearly spreading the football around. And the Titans did the same thing. They had eight players. Um, with at least one reception. So both teams clearly spreading it around, but there's a clear difference in philosophy and how they're throwing the football. Oh, yeah. Green Bay saying, we got a good running back. We got Josh Jacobs. We're going to lean on him. We're going to run the ball 37 times. We'll throw it. Uh, how much did they throw it? 19. I mean, they yeah. attempted 19 passes. Mm -hmm. When you have Josh Jacobs, just lean on him. I don't know why more teams with great running backs don't do that. And that includes the Colts. Exactly. No, I completely agree. Jonathan Taylor was number one on fantasy football like two years ago, and I still think he's got the juice if you get him get him the ball the right way. And so it's kind of interesting to see just the general philosophies across the board. And when we look at teams, we just talked about the Jets throwing it to a ton of people across the board, but their philosophy looked a lot different than the Packers did. The Packers, when I see a lot of receptions like that, it's not a lot of big throws like there's some long it's like yards after the catch kind of throws if you look at all of their longs they have mm -hmm. four or five receivers with more than 18 yards on their long catch of the day that's insane like yeah. they were just breaking that defense down and i think that's the philosophy that we like to see where they just move guys around and let them get a little agile where Jaden reed's kind of like that debo samuel where you just got to give these guys a little bit of space and they'll work and so that's what I think the Colts have to do as well. They have weapons. Just let them work. Don't make Richardson throw it super far just because he has a big arm. Yeah. Um, I think that's a, that is a good place to move to, to Colts bears. Um, <laughs> I don't, first off, I, I want to get the, uh, the, the Caleb Williams hatred out of the way. It, yeah. There, there should be no hatred. Caleb Williams looked like a third year quarterback who had no offensive line, and I know I said this in a thread, I'm just copying exactly what I said, had no offensive line, a young, very talented quarterback. I mean, he had some, let me tell you, he had some just drop in a bucket passes, just some on the run, jumping on the run, throwing it. He was fantastic. He did make some mistakes, but those are rookie mistakes. And I think a part of the problem with social media and the problem with just a fan in general is not being able to recognize these guys are going to take one, two, three, four, like sometimes five years to figure it out. Look at Sam Darnold. He's 27 
feels like he's been in the league for 10 years and he's actually starting to look like the quarterback that they expected him to in a completely different system. So give the kid a chance. My God, they're already saying that this situation is horrible for him. Oh, yeah. No, of course they are. And unfortunately, I'm with you. I think I accidentally spooked a lot of people online when I was making kind of a, a silly joke where I was like, I, I can only imagine the conversations in Chicago right now where Justin Fields is three and oh, and Caleb Williams is one and two. And, you know, <laughs> and I said it not as taking a side of what's, I just was like, I can just imagine a Chicago bar right now and people just arguing about it. And people took it as I was like, this was a bad idea. They should have never done it. Justin Fields would be better. I was like, no, I'm not taking a stance on this. I'm completely with what happened. The Bears would yeah. do that 99 times out of 100. That's what you should do as an organization. Justin Fields is in a better position. He's feeling better. But they're also not asking him to do a lot. I feel like if you transported him right back, it would be worse than what we're seeing from Caleb Williams, like you said. And this is the era of redemption quarterbacks. I mean, look around the league. It's not just Sam Darnold. It's Geno Smith. It's Baker Mayfield. It's Jared Goff. Like, think about that. It's even Matthew Stafford who got traded from the Lions to go win a Super Bowl. Yeah. Nobody gets it right out the gate. Not even Mahomes. Not even Love, the guys that sat for a couple of years. So mm -hmm. I'm off of this whole Williams is terrible. It's over. It's just, it's played out. I'm sorry I played into it a little bit, but I just was more <laughs> making a statement about this, the state of Chicago uh, yeah. in the downtown area. But um, yeah, no, I'm with you on that. The Colts definitely took advantage in that game. And I think they, they, they deserve to win at the end based on that O-line play. And, and this is, I think this is a philosophy on, on how quarterbacks are discussed and, and managed in this league now. And I can also, I can honestly equate it to pitching in, in major league baseball, where there needs to be a change, a fundamental change at the bottom. It needs to start as soon as these guys get here, just like with, with Tommy John. Pedro, uh, no one talks about this, but Pedro Martinez had a really good discussion about it where he said that these pitchers are weight training. When he was training, when Pedro Martinez was training in the 90s, they were doing a lot of uh, wire stuff. They're doing a lot of resistance stuff to build strength in the ligaments, yeah. not just to build strength in the muscles. The muscles are nothing without a strong ligament. Um, and to fix a Tommy John issue, you have to go to the base. You have to go to you know, single A, rookie ball. Here you have to go to year one. You can't be starting these guys year one. There is a very select few who can do it. Andrew Luck was one of them. Um, Peyton Manning was horrible his first year, and but he Think still about Trevor a lot of Lawrence. Like Trevor, Trevor Lawrence. Lawrence. Yeah, exactly. He also was in a horrible, Terrible. horrible situation. <laughs> that really didn't help him. I mean, so, I feel bad for the guy, even though I am a Colts fan, I feel bad for him. But there's a, <laughs> there's really only a select few that can actually look competent. And I think that's also why we're getting away from the quote, golden age of quarterbacks. Because mm -hmm. you point to, oh, we, we used to have Brady and Roethlisberger and even Rivers, like Rivers would be, you know, a top five quarterback now. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's not the same era and, and they have to get away from this because now if you think about it, almost every single rookie quarterback goes out there and starts. Jordan Love sitting for two years was like, oh my God, they should fire these people for totally. this. Like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> exactly. It's like, they have a plan. These guys yeah. have a plan. <laughs> yeah. And guess what? The plan can involve this though. 52 attempts from Caleb oh Williams throwing the game. The game was close all game. I know they had to claw back in that score is it was more like 21 to like 12, like below 10 or something at that point near the end. But it was, I mean, it was seven attempts. to three deep into the second half. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I just like, it's the polar opposites. We see Anthony Richardson can't, is not allowed to throw more than 20 times, but then Caleb Williams can throw 52 times. Talk about polar opposites. I don't even know what to make of these two teams, really, is how I play this whole game out right now. I don't know what to make of the Colts. I am, I, I've been like this since last year. I, I think that Shane Steichen is a Frank Reich Jr. I see his play calling. I see the way they describe him. It, it was almost the same path. He came from the Eagles, who went to the Super Bowl. I came from there as their offensive coordinator. He's still considered the, quote, quarterback whisperer. Frank Reich was a quarterback whisperer when he got hired in Indianapolis. Um, and it's just these basic moments of why are you just common sense, like very yeah. common sense moments. He just decides to, to, to go the other way, to zig when, when you should just be going straight, not when someone zags. Um, you can equate it back to the, to the Packer game last week. Um, fourth and one, 
they decide to run this like weird option with I, I'm pretty sure it was Trey Sermon in the game. Like they didn't even want Taylor in the game. Jonathan Taylor wasn't in the game all fourth quarter against Green Bay. And and again, you can point it to here. Uh, down on the goal line, I'm, I'm going to pull up the drive here in a second. Yeah. Um, it was the interception, the the horrible inter- or the, what looked like oh a horrible interception in in the end zone. The ball was tipped. I'll yeah, give it yeah. to that. I will give it to him. The ball was tipped. I hate the play call. They ran Taylor once on the goal line, or you know what, whatever in the four, and then ran Richardson, and then passed. You you just you're not giving your running back a chance. No. To score, this is Jonathan Taylor here. He's your yeah. highest paid running back. He's one of your highest paid players. You just pound the fucking rock. If you yeah. don't get in in four plays, I'm you know what? Fine by me. Fine by me. You don't get in in four plays, but just no reason. Why are you running like a bunch set <laughs> in in the red zone? Why are you dragging everyone to the same spot? <laughs> we saw a lot of interesting red zone philosophies, and we've seen it all season. I think there's yeah. an uptick in kickers, like making a bunch of field goals. I don't know the stat off the top of my head, but somebody said that. And then, yeah, red zone percentages are down in terms of touchdowns. Teams just aren't completing drives. It's the same with the Seahawks for the first two weeks. Yeah, we put it together, but our game was 17 to three for like three quarters. Like we had yeah. a deep ball. The deep, like I think teams are having weird philosophies at the red zone and they're trying to be too creative. Like they're, I'm seeing formations and sets that I don't often see. And I think these head coaches and offensive coordinators are just trying to be that, that cool kid on the block. Like I have yeah. something different today instead of just doing what's best. And you think about, I even go back to the time when um, week one, Detroit beat the Lions. I mean, Detroit beat the Rams in overtime. They ran the ball five times with David Montgomery, just bully ball down the field. And he just ran and ran. And they didn't even do that all game, but they decided to do it in overtime. And it just worked like simple philosophies just work. And I think they still work because maybe that's what's catching teams off guard because they're like, oh, they're going to do something crazy here. We have to make sure the edges are covered, but we also have two high safeties, et cetera. But I think, you just pound the rock, like you said, with Jonathan Taylor. It sounds like a pretty good strategy. And and you can even get creative. I mean, there's a reason you have Anthony Richardson. I am yeah. very against them running him inside yeah. inside the numbers. I don't want yeah. them running him inside the numbers. He already dropped his shoulder into someone on Sunday, like trying to run him over. It's like, dude, yeah. just <laughs> if you're going to try and run through him, at least like try and stand up a little straight. Don't don't just like hit your shoulder into his helmet. No. Um, no. The, the thing that. The thing that really worried me about the Colts and and uh, we had our defense struggled the first couple of weeks. Although the second half of Green Bay, they were a lot better. And I think a lot of people are fooled because we only gave up 16 points. We won, yay! All the problems are gone when you're winning. They had the Bears had 395 total yards of offense. Mm-hmm. That is a ugly number. Um, possession was not good either. I mean, they they had the ball for 35 minutes compared to our 24. Mm-hmm. That's that's better than 40 to 20 which yeah. what it was what it was the first couple of weeks. Um, but the three turnovers are, are clearly glaring and mm-hmm. a, and a fourth down, you know, in the red zone. Um, this Colts defense really just scares me and, and I'm not being fooled by it. No. And it's a little banged up too. If I saw it correctly, Buckner is a little bit banged up on the inside. And then your rookie yeah. Latu who came out of the draft already medically, like he, he, I don't know if you know this, he had to be, he had to stop Peyton playing Manning's football. Manning's next surgeon. Yeah, he had to stop playing football. And then he was medically cleared to actually come back. And, I mean, he was the first defender off the board. I liked – he is the best edge guy. But when you're talking about an injury-prone defense already and a defense that needs stability, I just – I never liked that pick for the Colts in the first place, even though I really like Latu as a player. So I'm interested to see how your line does because I'm a Seahawks fan. Our line's been terrible the past few years it starts with the big boys up front and then it works yeah. back you can have a bad secondary if you get a little bit of pressure in today's nfl we we've definitely gotten a lot of pressure our secondary is awful we didn't address <laughs> it in the draft that was my we we already lost our one of our big corners um, yeah. uh juju brents for the season mm-hmm. and and i remember i would be on in the comments or something with someone else and uh they'd be telling me no we have a good secondary like it doesn't matter how good they are if they can't stay healthy, and they're like, "But this year is different." I, statistically, that's it's not. It's it's going to happen again, and it happened game one where we got already torched. Um, I, this is a Chris. This like Chris Ballard is his seat is is boiling. It's oh, yeah. boiling in my yeah. opinion. And yeah. in my my hot seat, Shane Steichen is on. He, he's on my boiling hot seat. Oh, he's been boiling 
for the last <laughs> six months, actually more there like a go. year. Um, yeah. I just don't like his end of game decision making. Give it's him a little good. bit more time. He's kind of in that Brian Dable seat right now where I'm like, is the seat hot or does he have enough to even fully put it together yet? I'm I'm not fully out on him, but I can understand from a fan's perspective. You're kind of like, ugh, don't love all these decisions. And and a lot of people do. They love Steichen. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't see yeah. it, but I maybe I see something they don't. I don't know. Um Let's move to the Texans game. The yeah. Texans get absolutely just shit pumped, I think is the best word for it. Um, Stephon Diggs had a nice little revenge game, though. Ten receptions for 94 yards. Um, Aaron Jones looked great on the ground. Again, just it's it's something about that Vikings running back. They have a look. Just a oh, good yeah. look about them. Oh, yeah. No, and I love how you said revenge game. Does it technically count as a revenge game if it's your second time, second team <laughs> after? Like, I don't think you can come back and still have beef with the Vikings after <laughs> all this time. Maybe Diggs. It might maybe, be Diggs. If anybody, it's Diggs, for sure, for sure. But you're right, on the Vikings running back, I mean, geez, you go from Dalvin Cook, you go to Alexander Madsen, you go to Aaron Jones. Talk about three guys that, first of all, look aesthetically the same on the field, the way that they move. They're, they're multi-versatile. They're not just downhill runners they're able to catch the ball they're able to you know be a little bit of a speed back they're sneaky fast all three of them and so i mean when they picked up aaron jones i was like that's incredible like can i get him on my fantasy team i tried and i couldn't but that's exactly what you need to give a quarterback like sam darnold and what could have been jj mccarthy maybe part the way through the year so yeah the vikings i mean talk about the biggest surprise team of the first three weeks i think it has to be the vikings yeah, and there was a little bit of an injury scare with Darnold, but they said there's no structural damage in mm -hmm. his knee, so he is good. Yeah. Um, Eagles and Saints. This was just an ugly, gross game. Uh, I felt it was must win for the Eagles. I know that's pretty early. Week three feels early, but they're two and nine in their last 11. You got to figure it out at some point. And Nick Sirianni, I know Eagles fans are not happy with Nick Sirianni. His seat is no. boiling. Oh, it's boiling. It's boiling. And uh, for all the listeners, I, I did the due diligence for you. I watched that whole game. Like I've start to finish and I hated every minute. Cause I was like, are you kidding me with these decision-making on both teams? Like we could expect that the saints were going to slow down a little bit. I mean, 91 points in two weeks. That's not the saints. We know I took, I, I talked in my yeah. preseason episode. They're going to win the most annoying seven games of the year. I still think they're going to do that, but they came out, those first two weeks are kind of annoying because you're like, of course, I didn't even predict that that was going to happen. And so now they run into kind of this wall of an Eagles defense that we didn't expect to step up. But here's the problem with the Eagles. It's their offense. I love A.J. Brown, but when he's not on the field, what do they lose their identity? It's like Jalen Hurts yeah. doesn't know decision making. And so that's why I wrote a thread halfway through the game. And I was like, we need to talk a little bit about Jalen Hurts because I don't even think he's top five in the NFC when we talk about quarterbacks, but that Super Bowl hangover still seems to persist. And I don't know if it's just him might be decision-making might, but the fumbles and interceptions that unfortunately lands on his desk. And so I don't know. I didn't love what I saw. Saquon Barkley is the savior of that franchise right now. So shout out to him for literally breaking every tackle and scoring all those points. But yeah, I don't know. What are your thoughts on Hertz? Cause I I'm just a little bit worried about the way it looks visually with him. You know, I, I really thought I it's it's something about him. He he has like a swagger. He just has that he has that swagger. He has the confidence. Um but I, I agree with you where it worries me, where he can't make a decision without AJ Brown out there. He can't he needs the defense to draw to draw him off. He needs AJ Brown to draw everyone off of his other decision makers. I mean this point, just just give Saquon the ball every time. That, that's it's it, until yeah. this thing it, until this gets figured out with him. Just give it to Saquon and and let him do his thing. Although, I mean, knowing Saquon's injury history, I don't know. Um, and you could tell that could, they were kind of worried about that because for people that he had 17 carries on the day, but at least 12 of those were in the second half. Like they didn't use Saquon in the first half, and it was baffling to me. They were like pass, pass, first down, second down, and then a uh, halfback draw and third down kind of vibe. And I was like, I don't really understand the philosophy. Like, I, do, I understand not being too predictable where you're like, hey, I'm going to run on first down every time. But when you have Jalen Hurts who still can't figure it out, you don't have A.J. Brown out there. Dallas Goddard showed up. Thank you for a tight end really showing up big for a QB that needed him. 
But mm -hmm. I don't know the philosophy and the play calling. I think Kellen Moore kind of is on that Sirianni seat where it's like, I always hear Sirianni's. I mean, that whole coaching staff. I hear about Vic Fangio's defense. I hear about Kellen Moore's <laughs> offense all the time. But I just, I never fully see it where I'm like, oh, that's what everyone's talking about. I saw Vic Fangio's defense finally, but I didn't see that all last year in Miami. So it's kind of, it's interesting. I, I just don't know the philosophy and I don't even think the Eagles know fully what their philosophy is. I, I think there is, there is something to it where, the Nick, the Nick Sirianni decision-making and the play calling probably puts a lot more pressure on Hurts too, where he feels like he's got to, he, he has to one stand up for his coach. Cause he's uh Sirianni drafted him. Am I right about that? I can't remember. To be I'm honest. pretty sure I can't. Yeah. I can't remember either. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. I think that might've been whoever was there before uh, Doug Peterson. Mm -hmm. Maybe he drafted him. I can't yeah. remember those, those like four years just get all <laughs> jumbled up in my brain. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I definitely think there is pressure on on Hertz to alleviate a little bit of those like really poor decision making or decisions made by Sirianni on play calling or I mean they had they had back to back drives that ended on downs. Oh yeah, because they're going <laughs> for it on fourth all the time. Yeah, like what what is going on here? You have a blocked punt. I'm just looking at like the end of the drive, blocked punt, missed field goal, like all this like just stupid stuff, fumble, like this stuff, interception. Yeah. This stuff should not be happening to a team that they're telling us is a Super Bowl contender. Exactly. And one of those turnover on downs was a tush push opportunity, fourth and one, fourth and two. And they actually did like a reverse tush push where they looked like they were going to run it and then tried to run it around the outside and it just got stuffed. And I was like, that's what I'm talking about, the creativity where I think teams are like your tush push works. Just keep doing it. I don't yeah. know why we're reinventing the wheel in these key spots. And then, yeah, that missed field goal. I think that was like at least 55 plus. It was deep. It wasn't a, a close one for Jake Elliott, Elliott, who's got a great leg on him. So you can't yeah. really blame him for missing a few of those uh, in today's NFL. I, I think the, uh, the analytics have ruined uh, coaching and decision making. It feels like analytics. They are the coaches now. AI is the coach, and the coaches are just the mouthpiece. It used to be we'll use analytics, you know, help us make a fifty-fifty decision, but we go with our gut on certain things. Like, I mean, the 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 that stupid tush push is like one of the best examples of just do what works, man. That shit works every time. Exactly. exactly. No reason exactly. to. They should have taken no. notes from Anthony Richardson on. On his tush push. Exactly. I don't know if you saw that. Exactly. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah. The Anthony Richardson finally doing that kind of Jalen Hurts impression that we need to see uh, with stuff like that. I love it. I love those, it. those are the things that like set, make me buy back in on him. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. This guy mm -hmm. could be our quarterback for the next 15 years. The throw <laughs> against Houston, like all those, like those little moments, you know? Um, he had that one throw in college in Florida where he like did a 360 oh, yeah. and then like threw a red zone touchdown or something like that. That's when everyone fell in love with him. And I'm yeah. with you. I'm all for it's this one throw that gets me excited. But man, <laughs> I don't know if I could live like that every week. Like it's just so the, up and down. The guy, I mean, some of his misses, I literally just bursted out laughing. Like my dad was watching with me. He's like, what's so funny? I was like, that is just so bad. I was like, yeah. there's and, and I expected it. I watched him at Florida. I'm a Gator fan. I'm like a Gator and USF Bowl fan. I'm a Bowl, yeah. Bulls alumni, um, always a Gators fan. And I watched nice. him there, and I was like, this kid is very – he's a physical specimen, but he sucks. Like, he's yeah. not very good right now, and a lot of this stuff could be ironed out with the right squad. And they're just – the Colts fans aren't giving him a shot. I mean, the media isn't giving him a shot either. No, of course it's going to be two to three years. It's I'll now or that. never with any quarterback. That's how it unfortunately works in the media, and I hate it as well. It's just, just, just money. That's all that. Yeah, that's all they care about. Exactly. Um, Chargers, Steelers. Justin Fields is undefeated as a starter. I've never said that before. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe in Ohio State. Uh, yeah. And Justin Herbert left the game early. Um, mm -hmm. with an ankle injury which i think that was re-aggravated am i correct about that yeah he w he already came into the game questionable uh i thought it was an interesting decision i understand wanting to be three and oh this is an opportunity to beat a team uh that looks beatable the most beatable looking two and O team at that point <laughs> but you are going against a great defense and you were going to get pressure on herbert and yeah you just were bound to have a re-aggravation there hopefully it's not too serious i haven't seen anything since um Mike Tomlin, it's so funny. That's his like entire theme of oh. probably the last five, six years of this is the most beatable 3-0 and team of all time. They oh, just yeah. look like it. 
but they're still three and up. They're still winning these games. And that's, that is like that old stu- old school coaching style that is dying out, which I wish it would because yeah. he does the smart things. He does the common sense things and they work. They're going to the playoffs. They, they went last year, like weirdly, somehow they made it. Even after losing to the Colts, they made it. Um, yeah. I, I would take I would take Mike Tomlin in a heartbeat on my team. Oh, for sure. I think he's gonna be if he for whatever reason gets like let go after the season. I think he's gonna be somewhere like immediately. I think his philosophies and just a better a market where he can get higher named guys. Maybe like I don't know what he needs, but if you're looking at teams that complain about bad offensive line play. The Steelers have a banged up young offensive line, but they're still putting together efficient drives where they're trusting Justin Fields to throw it 32 times against the against the Chargers. I mean, yeah, there is something to be said about Tomlin's philosophy, and I think it's very much underappreciated, kind of like Matthew Stafford was for all those years before he got his due. Yeah, Fields, 25 of 32, 245. His average was 7.7. 7. Nothing like – it was nothing sexy, but mm-hmm. again – it. it just got it done and and they ran the ball 31 times um i don't really know they th- oh i guess i i can't remember i didn't watch this game i i had no interest in this game this was a gross no. game just looking at the stats here i feel like you should have seen la run it a lot more oh yeah Am I no i don't know why that? i don't know why they went away from it because it was close for most of that game 20 to 10 is kind of deceiving it was 10 to 10 for a long time. And the way that I high level summarized it was the team that wanted to be three and oh one more today. Yeah. you like, that's just what it came down to. And it did just kind of fell out of their philosophy as a team. And I think Harbaugh thought there was something down the field that they needed to exploit maybe with their secondary, but because they, they're the Steelers are good up front. So you look at them and you're like, how are we going to beat them through the air? And Justin Herbert has the arm to do it, but it just was a weird game. No real flow on either side. And I think, in a game like that, the Steelers are just going to win it because they have the experience of winning like that. And Harbaugh's still yeah. new, trying to figure out the pieces on the offensive side. It's definitely like that West Coast versus the oh, yeah. the Northern Cold. Like that Northern Cold is going to win every time. It just <laughs> yeah. is. There's something even about in September. It. <laughs> yeah. yeah, even in September, it's just it's yeah. that field. I I love when the field gets all chopped up and it yeah. looks gross in like November, yeah. December. That's football. Looking at SoFi. I'm sorry. That's just not football. That's that's, a, that's like Apple sponsored football. I was about to say that's like Silicon Valley of football right there. <laughs> it's really is. And they're always trying to do something new too, just like Silicon Valley. But the North doesn't change. They don't. They mm-hmm. never change, and they never need to. Yeah. No. It's it's where sports were born. It's where you know all the history lies for sure. Yeah. Uh, Broncos Bucks. This one big shock, of course. Um, again, I I didn't watch this one. I don't know what. I just don't know what happened here. I mean, the Bronco, like Bo Nix suddenly just became competent. <laughs> it, it's interesting. To, I think this is what can summer. It's a quick, easy summary. It's the Bucks came into this game 2-0. and They felt comfortable. They probably watched the Seahawks film of the Broncos and were like, well, Bo Nix doesn't want to throw it down the field. They're, Peyton doesn't allow him to throw it down the field. He likes to check down. He had the lowest air yards through the first two weeks, something along those lines, or at least bottom five. And that's to be expected with the rookie. So I think the Bucks just got a little over their skis where they're like, oh, easy win this week. But they're a team that is not a 12-win team. They they need to be more like level set with their expectations. That 10 and 7 is a, is a successful season, especially in that division. So I think they just lulled themselves into sleep, felt a little confidence, and Sean Payton was like, let's let Knicks throw the ball down the field a little bit more. And that's what worked because they didn't run it a ton. If you look at the carries, 28 carries spread out amongst all of them, nine of which were Bo Nix. Bo Nix just had better decision-making, a better game plan. That's really what it came down to and a solid defense that kind of slowed down, like we saw with the Saints. It just slowed down that NFC South hype of a couple of those teams. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to get back to my games here. Uh, Come on. There you go. Where am I at? Oh, game of the week. I called this. We posted it on the Chaotically Intolerant, all of our socials, like last week before it even happened. Panthers beat the Raiders, destroy the Raiders. This was the game I was watching at 4 o'clock. I had this this on. I didn't even have Red Zone on. I was like, I want to watch this. Um, Andy Dalton, the Andy Dalton bump is real. Uh, the Raiders are like thinking about going away from Minshew already. I think that's a little premature my opinion yeah. 
Um, but I have to do my victory lap. This was oh, yeah. just awesome. <laughs> no, you wouldn't have predicted it. I, I wrote a thread today being like, and the winner of the biggest jump, high hopes to lowest lows, is the Raiders. I mean, yeah. talk about beating the Ravens, an AFC championship team, to then losing to the lowly Panthers that everybody gave up on. I'm completely with you. It, that that cake was right there to take, but I didn't even want to eat it. I was like, I still think the Raiders are going to win because the Panthers, they're just too much mystery. But you're completely right. That red rocket bump is real. There was a little bit more cohesion, a little bit more easy decision making. There wasn't as much. I think Bryce Young just has too much athletic ability where he can kind of overthink it. And Andy Dalton's like, I'm not going to outrun these guys. I'm going to stay in the pocket. I'm going to take what's given. We're going to play action me out of the pocket if I need a move. And yeah. You're right on that. I'd love to get your take on on, on the Panthers there because the Raiders, bad business decisions were made, according to Antonio Pierce as that coach. So we'll see. <laughs> Andy Dalton looked like Andy Dalton of old. He, I mean, in his decision making, again, it was, it looked like he knew where he was going with the ball immediately and he put it exactly where he wanted it. It was like watching a 78 year old play golf. They're going to, they're not going to hit it far, but they're going to hit it straight. And it's going to be consistent. It's going to go the same distance every single time. I mean, Andy had some fantastic throws. There was even one the broadcast was giving him shit for. They're saying, oh, that was a bad throw. It was a poor decision, but he dropped it into double coverage directly into, I think it was Deontay Johnson, directly into Deontay Johnson's arms, and it got knocked out and almost picked off. But it was, he was, I mean, he was vintage Andy Dalton. I don't know if anyone's ever said that before. I don't know if vintage and Andy Dalton has ever come up in the same sentence um but there's something about that red with the blue you know he's just he's a handsome guy he's he's yeah. got it going on man he's he's aging well for sure oh, yeah. and i think all of that time on the bench unfortunately is aging him well where i think he's just seen the game a little bit better and if you think yeah. about dave canales he's kind of the quarterback whisper he brought geno smith back to life he then brought baker mayfield back to life Talk about Andy Dalton being exactly what those two guys are. I'm not here to be crazy. I'm just here to tell me what to do, coach. That's what my strategy is. Bryce Young is looking to get his foot in, using the, looking to get his athleticism. I think he has too many tools and not enough tools that are important to what Dave Canales likes that Andy Dalton, unfortunately, is exactly what a Dave Canales quarterback is. So like you said, I think he just was way more efficient. I think his bad throws were good throws. Let's all not get too crazy and say they're about to win a couple more because the Raiders, yeah. I mean, talk about an issue. Um, but it was fun for one week for sure. I, I was like very my, – my entire take was they're going to get that one-week bump and then they'll drop off again. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's usually what those teams do. But it was it was just seemed like the perfect, perfect, like look-ahead spot. They're coming in so hot, especially they're coming home. You know, it always feels like those home games after a big road win. They always come out a little sleepy. They're probably drinking after, you know. <laughs> they're, they're like uh, C.J. Adams from the from the Nationals, probably out till 8 a.m. at a, at a <laughs> casino. Um, but uh, I was very happy for Panthers fans. You know, we, uh, we had a pretty good influx in some of our clips on TikTok, um, and there were some Panthers fans. So, somebody commented before the game saying, get the fuck out of here. They're, they're not going to beat them. And then, of course, they did. Um, yeah. And I was pretty nice to the guy. I was just like, hey, you starting to sweat? And he was like, absolutely, yeah. I'm starting to sweat. This is why we play the games. That's why they say that phrase. Yep, absolutely. Um, but go Panthers, man. Keep pounding. <laughs> I love but it. I'm just not. It. Unless it's Andy Dalton, I'm probably not even going to root for him anymore. But if yeah. it's Andy Dalton, I'm there. Um, and then your game, Dolphins Seahawks. I feel like there's actually not that much to really talk about here. No. No, it just was a good, we came out strong. That's kind of the yep. way it was. We took care of business right off the gate. We got to Skylar Thompson early and often. There was no O-line. I mean, we talk about Tua's decision-making. I think that's the biggest thing we can take from here. But I think it's the philosophy and the, the people they have on the line. They lost a couple guys in like Hunt who went to uh, the Panthers specifically. They just don't, they have names, but those names are not, as good as people want to say. So I think that's where it needs to start. They were unable to really hold the pocket long enough for those big plays that they like to do down the field. And we saw that pretty quick. Obviously Tua is a way better quarterback than Skylar Thompson, but yeah, the Seahawks were just ready to play, but then just kind of let off the gas for the rest of the game. So 24 to three looked good, but it really was 17 to three till like the very end. So I'll take you it. You guys did exactly what you had to do and nothing more. And exactly. that's, 
in those games you're not you don't want to risk injury one like exactly. dk is is a giant muscle so he's just like tyreek they're both giant muscles and they just yeah. they can get hurt very easily yeah um but that's all you have to do you don't want to risk any of that you don't want to put in too much effort um 100%. the dolphins my my best description of them they've always been like this is chicken shit that's their that's the description it's yeah. chicken shit it's yeah we we run really really fast but we saw it in Kansas City last year. We saw it in Buffalo a couple of years ago. It's just they're not playing football. They're it's a track meet. They're yeah. they're at a track meet. And in September and October and even November, it works. It works okay. And especially in Miami, I live in uh, Sarasota, Florida, so I'm not far from Miami. I've been to a game down there. It's it's all sexy. It's always sexy. But football in December isn't sexy. It's no. it's gross. It's mm -hmm. gritty. It's you got to be cold. And the Colts are the same way. Dome teams play horrible in mm -hmm. in uh, in the cold. It's chicken yeah. shit football. That's I'm with you. Is. I'm with you. They don't they don't like to hit you in the mouth, as they say as well. And and so it's unfortunate because I was I had high hopes for the Dolphins as well as I thought they could make some noise if healthy with Tua. But uh, I'm backstepping that now. Who's who's your pick to because uh, they can't roll with Thompson, and obviously they got Huntley. Yeah. Who are you looking at? I guess is more of a sleeper pick. Like you could maybe be like, oh, maybe they'll go get this guy. Who do you think they could go get? I mean, bring Tannehill home. Bring him to his first spot where he started out. That's, I mean, I know a lot of people kind of forget that, but he did start in Miami. He did go to Tennessee yeah. and find a lot of success. But if we're looking for that uh, Joe Flacco right off the couch moment, I think that is uh, – Mr. Ryan Tannehill, but he might be a little expensive. And I think them doing the Huntley thing takes that off the table, but we'll see because Huntley just needs to learn the playbook. That's why he didn't play last week. So I expect to see him uh, this upcoming week. What about, I mean, I, I, we just talked about him and this could be very like short sighted of me, Andy Dalton. I mean, he's, he's looking for a, a nice little place. You don't even know if two is going to survive. I mean, everyone's been talking about Bryce Young. Why would the Panthers give up on Bryce Young? It's been no. two seasons. There's no yeah. reason to. You have Andy Dalton right there. It, let's say they go and get the shit kicked out of him the next couple of weeks with Andy Dalton. Why not just say, you know what? Put the kid back in. Get him more reps. Get Andy Dalton down there. Because I just don't think the Carolina Panthers are going to give him up. I think that's the answer. No. I think Dave Canales is going to find enough success where it's like, let's keep him around as a safety valve for our team and go from there, but it's not a terrible prediction. We'll have to see if Andy finds any amount of success. He might be priced out yeah. of Carolina where the Dolphins could jump yeah. in. And um, what was I going to say? Oh my God. I just lost. I completely lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of games. <laughs> it's a lot. Of it, games. There is a lot. It's, but it's football. It's awesome. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. Ravens, Cowboys. This was gross until it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. No. Totally. That's the way of putting it. I mean, the score still tells a weird story. I think the Ravens had that in full and complete control and just kind of like what I talked about with the Seahawks kind of lulled themselves to sleep a little bit. And the Cowboys are a good enough team to come back because they're not the Miami Dolphins. They're healthy. They have their guys. So I'm not surprised that they fought back, but the Ravens were like, here's, here's where we're at. Like, good luck. And Lamar Jackson, I think is 20 and one versus NFC teams. Like he comes wow. to the NFC and dominates. It's, it's something like that. It's right there. I threaded about it. I forgot it, but it's, he's only lost once to an NFC team. That's how good he is when it's a, a blue conference team. But um, yeah, so I'm, I, Lamar just was Lamar. Derrick Henry was Derrick Henry and their defense uh, stepped up once again against a kind of a, an underwhelming Cowboys team. I'd say so far. They did just add Yannick and Goku back today yes. as well. Anyone exactly. who's listening and didn't catch that. Um, the Hospital Bowl, Rams and 49ers. I, I can't say anything about either of these two teams. They're just missing way too much. You, mm -hmm. There's nothing that comes out of this. No. Well, here's what comes out of this. We're all going to forget <laughs> this right now. We're going to forget yeah. all the injuries right now. And then let's say the Seahawks win the division in the NFC. The 49ers are going to be 10 and seven and everyone's going to be like, ah, whatever. They lost to all these teams. Remember all those early losses. And they're going to forget that Kittle CMC Debo were, were all out like, and Trent Williams is even banged up. But if God is on their side, they're going to get healthy by that time. And if that's the case, they're going to be the scariest 10 and seven team coming out of the wild card. 
anyone's ever seen. So that's what you yeah. can take out of it. And that's the same with the Rams where you just can't write off the NFC West. That's why I hate being in the NFC West because <laughs> I mean, any given week, we just have trouble with all of them and they kick everybody's ass too. And so I just, I, I would take, look how much depth these teams have enough to get them wins. Kind of like what we see with the Vikings, you know, and that, that kind of grittiness. And so I don't know. I, I put that whole conference as, or division as, the scariest 10 and seven teams you'll see in the playoffs. Yeah. Who, who knows? That's your winner. Who knows? Yeah. Exactly. Um, Lions Cardinals. Again, okay. another really odd, odd game. Um, it, I don't, did they score in the second half? I feel like nobody scored. That's a great Maybe question. It's a, a great question. Got to jog my memory there. It was low scoring. Like that 20 to 13 was a slow one field goal. It was 20 to 10 for a long time. There was yeah. one field goal at the end of the second half at 3.48 to go. That was the lone scoring play in the second half. Yeah. And and Laporta, unfortunately, gets injured for the Lions. I think that's the biggest takeaway uh, for them, plus their defensive edge. I forgot his name off the top of my head. But he also got injured, so they lost that. And now they only have Hutch, Hutchinson coming around the edge. So we'll have to see how their defensive line looks. It's, it's kind of in that narrative of anybody in the trenches right now. So if I'm the, if I'm the Lions, I take a good win against a gritty, you know, Cardinals team that just kicked the crap out of, you know, the Rams the week before. And you got Amon Ra involved. You got Montgomery and Gibbs, that one-two punch. And Goff didn't look terrible. He didn't lose you the game, but he threw a two touchdowns, one interception. That sounds like a Goff storyline week to week right yeah. there. Yeah, that's a perfect Jared Goff day. uh and then chiefs falcons controversial again and i'm gonna say this it's it people can't wrap their heads around it it's not just the refs don't throw an interception earlier in the game like don't don't go for it on fourth down when you can go down one with like four minutes to go yeah there's so many other decision decisions that can be made and i'd say this about the colts if the colts you know, won a game on something or lost a game or whatever. I'd say the same thing. It's your decision-making. It is your analytics. That's just the most recent thing you can remember. That's the most recent bad thing to your team in that game that you can remember was the pass interference, although that was a pass interference. I mean, it just was. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think where this all comes from, and I'm going to bring my wife into this, as you probably saw her walking around. She said the perfect quote as a casual fan on the uh, watching on the couch. She was like, do the people not like the Chiefs? Because she watched how oh. that game ended. And I'm like, I mean, they are on their way to a three-peat potentially. They win games like this. The refs are on their side. Patrick Mahomes, Taylor Swift, Travis Scott. Like, there's so much media with them. It's easy for a lot of people not to like them. So even the casual fans are like, wow, the Bengals should have won last week. And, oh, the Ravens should have won week one. And then this week, you're like, the Falcons kind of had their number there at the end. But you're right. You can't blame it on all of that, unfortunately, because there's so much other game to play. They make the right decisions when it counts. The refs did kind of give them kind of that makeup call, I would say, on that Falcons drive. Yeah. Like that holding or pass interference on Drake London or what that really wasn't pass interference and got them closer to even have that second shot. And then when you run that weird jet sweep with B. John Robinson four yards out instead of going downhill, yeah. I mean, that's what we have to be talking about, not the PIs that they both kind of made up on, even though it does feel revisionist history at this point uh, with the chiefs. So I'm with you on that. I mean, the Cincinnati don't, don't fumble. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't yeah. have a fumble return for a touchdown. Like that is one of like fumbles return for touchdown feel even rarer than a pick six. So it's <laughs> yeah. like, that just should never happen. A good exactly. team doesn't let that happen. And then since yeah. he went and kicked a field goal and went back up, and then they let Kansas City go, you know, keep driving the foot, driving down. Kansas City had a fourth and six called back. Or, yes, yeah. they had a convert. They got a fourth and six. It yeah. was called back to fourth and 16. And then you had the penalty. Kansas City, great teams know how to put themselves in positions to win. And, yes, the refs, you know what? Let's say the refs help them. Why are you letting it? Why are you letting them decide your game? Just yeah. go play your game and be the best you can be in what you can control. That's exactly. It. And that and that's the thing when you go back to that, a lot of the people are pointing towards the Falcons could have kicked a field goal that first time down instead of going for it. And then they would have been in a better position to then kick another field goal and actually, you know, really be something there. So it's decision making at certain points. I agree that they should have went for it maybe, but throwing to 
everyone's favorite. Uh, this guy's going to have a good year. Kyle, Kyle Pitts may, might not be my first option in the red zone, <laughs> but you know, I agree. That was PI. That is what it is. That's just football, unfortunately, at the end of the day. There is a consent. I will say there is a consistency issue when it comes to the refs. There, there yeah. absolutely has yeah. been. I watched Anthony Richardson get slammed on his head. His helmet flew off and yeah. there was no, no I saw penalty. that too. That was yeah. terrible. I was like, holy. And God. I was screaming. I, yeah. You know, I was screaming. I mean, oh, the TV yeah. obviously can hear me. Obviously, <laughs> it goes right into the ref's ears to hear what I scream. Uh, <laughs> exactly. But at the end of the day, again, it's execution and what you can control. And they didn't execute. And that's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a very big Taylor Swift fan. I, I love Taylor yeah. Swift. I think she's great for the game. Yeah. Travis looks Agreed. exhausted. He oh. looks exhausted. He's got to stop going done. to her concerts. I think he's done. I think that off season program of concerts all summer and beach vacations in <laughs> Europe sounds awesome. Don't get me wrong, but Absolutely. at his age, he needs to, he needs to be in the locker room in the weight room even more than he needs to. Because, yeah. you know, at 35, you talk, you hear Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers being like, I've never felt better. It's probably because they live and breathe the ball. And I think, I think it's healthy. You know, Travis Kelsey is just looking at the next phase of his life and I'm not going to knock him for it, but yeah. I mean, the production has been down, unfortunately, so far to start the year. Yeah, Mahomes even talked about it. He said they're they're putting two and three guys, and you know, I I I don't know if it's super fair to say, but they did that to Gronk. And if you want to have the if you want to have the tight end debate, yeah. they did it to Gronk. I still think Gronk is it's again. I think that's such a nuanced debate as well. They're just different. They're it's a completely different position they play now. Yeah. Gronk is that big bruiser, and Kelsey is a wide receiver, glorified wide receiver. Yeah. So yeah, it's a difficult debate to have. It's apples and oranges for um, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's move to the Monday night games. Uh, the Bills yep. are just absolutely kicking the snot <laughs> out of the Jags. The Jags are the Jags are so bad. They are so bad. I don't want to ever hear about them again. I said it last year. I don't ever want to hear about the Jags again. And I heard about them. They blew a big lead. Now I got to hear about them again this year. Uh, uh-uh. I'm still done with them. No. And, and in a conference where it's wide open, I mean, the Texans oh, only became the relevant. South. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like it just became a, a, like competitive last year with the Texans really coming on, yeah. but it was a battle of who wants to be nine and eight, 10 and seven last year in that, yeah. in that division. And so, yeah, I, I wrote a thread before the game saying, Oh, Josh Allen kind of has a kryptonite in Trevor Lawrence. He's never beaten Trevor Lawrence. He, and it's only two wow. games, but Trevor Lawrence is two and O oh against Josh Allen. Well, it looks like he's about to be two and one uh, after tonight, thirty-seven to ten, as we're recording this right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, them. I think them doing the Trevor Bank thing too. Uh, what, who did they play last week? They played. Um, that's oh, a good question. Shoot, actually. I can't remember who it was. They played the Browns it an and they lost. they lost. The Browns. Yeah, when they did the Trevor Bank thing, I yeah. was like, "Oh, they're gonna, they're gonna lose. They're, they're losing. They're not gonna be good this year." Is I, I don't even know. I don't pay attention to them enough because I just don't no. care about them. What is their issue? What is the problem here? It feels like I know they don't have a number one wide receiver. I will say that. Yeah. Travis Etienne is awesome, mm-hmm. but he is not a number one wide receiver. Mm-hmm. I think that that's their big issue. I, I, Yeah, I think it comes down to that. They are really banged up on their defensive side right now. That's no excuse in today's NFL, unfortunately, because everybody's banged up. You know, I go ask the 49ers in a few weeks if they're able to change it. I would have more trust that the 49ers would change and be able to still win games over the Jaguars. And I think it goes back to I went on another podcast, Three the Hard Way Sports, if you've checked them out, and said they were like, who is kind of your the coach on the hot seat. And I didn't want to give the normal names that everyone's been giving. I don't think Doug Peterson's getting enough hot seat buzz because I agree. His like his kind of philosophy for football is just not working. He's kind of falling into that Frank Reich era. Like you're talking about where it's a great name. He did a lot of great things, but is it really still working? Is, are they being too aggressive? Are they not using their weapons well enough? And is the development within the building good? Because I just don't see that development from Trevor Lawrence enough. And I don't think they're putting him in advantageous situations where we can put it all on Trevor Lawrence. Because, I mean, the kid's 6'5", natural freak uh, quarterback. There's no way he's just the problem. You know, there's just no way. So that's kind of my thoughts. I think I was more scared of the Jaguars when they had Blake Bortles. And I'm not even (laughs) talking about like 2017 because he was just explosive. I mean, Blake was... He, he could do anything. He was he was great in the two minute drill. He was fantastic. Oh my god! Oh, yeah. And Trevor, like, it's just like, can he go win a football game? It doesn't really feel like it. No, 
No, and they're, no, they're always low there's scoring. There's no aura game. to to use a Gen Alpha term. There's no aura. <laughs> there is no aura. They don't even have a meta in place. The, what's the philosophy? <laughs> you know, all the all the phrases you can use it all. I unfortunately like the Jaguars, and I really thought let's let's piece it together. There's no way they're going to lose seven games in a row like they did last year, but they're continuing that losing streak right now, unfortunately. So yeah. I don't know what to say. There's nothing else to say. Um, <laughs> they suck. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, commanders and Bengals. So we have a close one here. We're we're at a twelve fifty eight in the third. The commies are just taking it to them. Um, yeah. What is wrong with the Bengals, man? I, I feel like they're always on the cusp. They're they're always just there. It's like they almost beat the Chiefs, and yeah. and they're just looking for that like moment, and they just haven't had that moment the past couple of years. And I think it really comes down to Joe Burrow just hasn't been on the field enough. You think about last year that he just didn't play, you know, at the most of the year because of that wrist injury. And he's coming back a fresh camp. He didn't have many restrictions, but early on in camp he did, where they were like testing it and not making sure not to hurt him. And I feel like we didn't get to see the camp footage as much, but I can guarantee you there was a lot of like, let's not put Burrow in a weird spot. We'd rather him have live reps during a game than live reps during practice. That just, that's just kind of my feeling based on how it's looked. And you think about their schedule the first three weeks. We talk about trap games. I mean, the Patriots week one is the biggest trap game you can have because the Patriots are supposed to be the worst team. Everybody that predicts the worst team is usually a little bit wrong. I mean, the Seahawks a few years ago when Geno Smith stepped in, we were supposed to be literal heart garbage. You get comeback player of the year. We're going to the playoffs. I'm Go not the saying playoffs. the Patriots are going to do that, but they're frisky. They're frisky. They have a good defense, fresh perspective in the building, a little bit of boost to life. The Bengals feel like a played out narrative, unfortunately, that just hasn't worked. So when are people going to get tired in the building of it just not working? It's kind of that Bills 49ers, like, you're great, but can you get over the hump kind of vibe? And so they fell into that. Then they go to the Chiefs where they're all amped up, emotional. It goes the way it goes. It's it's like a letdown from a drug. You like you got to just come back to life a little bit. And I think the commanders, who again are just like the Patriots, everyone's like they're they're pretty, they're pretty bad. Are they really that bad though? They're brand new. Everything's exciting to them. Yeah. So of course they're gonna go out and give you their best. And I think that's what's showing right now. But this is just what I'm guessing. I haven't I obviously watched it, so I'm interested to see the tape. Yeah, the commander's defense just gets rolled over. I think we saw that last week, even with the mm -hmm. Giants putting up 18 points with no kicker. They had no mm -hmm. kicker, and they still put up 18 points. Um, but the offense is like, I think there definitely is a spark plug there, and that's mm -hmm. Jaden Daniels. And if you can get a spark, you never know. You, you can get a real good flame going, and they have a flame going right now. Um, and all, I, I do want to end the week three games on this note. I have a beef with the NFL on the schedule making. Why are we getting so many good games early? Do they not? We all know they need these guys need some time to get used to things, get used to the speed again, get, you know, fully healthy. Some of these guys are coming in a little hurt. Mm -hmm. Why are we not getting these big games week seven, eight, nine, ten? Like Chiefs Ravens, you're burning your AFC or your AFC championship rematch day one. Day one, you're burning it. That drives <laughs> me crazy. I mean, so a few few different sides of that. I, I'm with you, but I'm also like, I can understand the business side. You think about last year, everybody and their mom got hurt, especially the quarterbacks that everybody cares about. So they're like, hey, let's bump it up. Also, we know this about anything. We know this about podcasts. If anyone's still listening right now, they really care. But a majority of your audience probably already logged off. Yeah. That's the same with mine. And so you put your best stuff at the beginning to grab your audience. So I think they're trying out a little bit of method because if you think about all the primetime games last year, Thursday night, Monday night, they just had bad matchups, a lot of backups and people didn't enjoy it. They put a lot of eggs in that Jets basket or that Broncos basket and it just oh. it didn't pay off. And so I think the NFL was like, let's stop doing that. Let's give good games as off early as often as we can because that's just what the viewer wants. And if we look back on the season, say everybody gets hurt again, we're still going to remember the first few weeks and be like, those were some pretty fun games. I mean, Monday night last night was a great game. You know, the first couple of Thursday nights have been fun games. So um, I don't know. I, I can see both sides, but I'm with you that I hope there's still some good games left. I mean, I'm looking next week, Monday night, my Seahawks versus Lions. I think that's going to be a great test that for both of those teams. Yeah. So excited like there. That. Yeah. All right, let's go to week four. Give me, give me your pick. Give me one sentence, and then I'll give you my pick in one sentence. I'm going to start with Thursday night game. Cowboys, Giants in New York. That's great question. My one sentence would be Cowboys back on track, Giants back down to earth would be the way that I'd do it. I think 
yeah, I think we saw the Giants, you know, take advantage of a weak team this past year. So I hope the Cowboys get back on track. I, I'm going Cowboys 100%, putting my 100% seal on it. Um, oh, wow. Just go back to week one of last year. Uh, prime time in New York. They they beat them 40 to nothing. And I have I just don't believe in the Giants whatsoever, even though they did Fair. win this week. I'll give it to them. Um, Saints-Falcons in Atlanta. I think Saints get back on track. Falcons, you know, a little bit of an emotional letdown. We've seen that already. Every team that has an emotional game kind of steps back. And I think the Falcons, uh, I think the Saints, you know, revamp their offense, get a little bit more creative here going into week four. I think I'm going to go opposite with you. I'm going to go Falcons. I think the Saints are going to stay on that little offensive lull that they had last week. Sure. Yeah. Um, the Falcons are, I don't think they're slouches either on defense. So I think we could definitely see probably another low scoring affair, I think, but it is divisional. So that's also throw out the record books as every, it every announcer has more. ever said, <laughs> it, just it just means, means more, baby. More. <laughs> uh, Rams bears in Chicago. Ooh, that's a tough one. It's really going to depend on the injury report, but I think I'm going to give the bears kind of a bounce back here. I think. It's similar vein. The Rams are just so banged up. I think, you know, you come off of that 49ers game. I think the Bears have a moment to kind of figure th some things out and beat a team that they need to beat. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go Bears just because I feel like Caleb Williams, he's really, he really doesn't want to lose three in a row. Like, that's not something he's used to. And, and I think he is good enough where he could will this team. I did see, you did see drives against the Colts where he willed them down the field mm -hmm. with his own, just his skill. Um, so I'm going Bears. This is an interesting one. Vikings Packers. I don't even know if we're getting Jordan Love back or not, uh, but it is in Green Bay. I think we're getting Jordan Love back, and I think he wins, and I think he stops the Vikings. He was supposed to come back this week in terms of questionable. He tried out. He practiced on the field, tried to figure it out. I'm glad that they sat him because this is the perfect time to bring him back. Stop the Vikings. It's a divisional game. The Packers just have that f winning formula. They're two and one, but you think about that Eagles game was so long ago. The Vikings are on a hot streak, but every every good thing comes to an end, and I think the Packers in this kind of situation with Jordan Love. I don't think that Eagles-Packers game told me anything. That was a weird game. The field was weird. It was in Brazil. There was, I don't know, gang gang fights or something. I, <laughs> you know, you, you had the risk of it, um, but I'm going Packers as well. I, I think the Vikings do have to come back down to earth a little bit. Yeah. Um, Steelers Colts in Indianapolis. Okay. I mean, the Steelers have done nothing but grind out wins. And guess what? A Colts team that is still trying to find their identity. Unfortunately, I think I'm going with the Steelers. I'm I'm riding with one set of hype, and I think it's this because the Colts, I just don't I don't know quite yet. I see offensive explosion against the Texans, and then I see last week, and I'm like, what do I have? With the Steelers, I know what I have, and it's consistent, so I'm going with the Steelers. I, I go, I always pick against the Colts. I'm going Steelers. Well. Uh, I, I need to see like a true sustained touchdown drive. I need to see a, a, a few 10 play, you know, like 10 minute drives or even like six, seven minute drives. Um, yeah. So I'm going Steelers. They're, they're just too well coached. Yeah. Uh, Broncos Jets, Nathaniel Hackett's second revenge game. <laughs> it's, it's back to the the double revenge game. Uh, I got to go Jets here. I think the Broncos had a fun time last week, but I think the Jets really found their groove, especially on defense. I mean, people like to say the Patriots aren't good, but you, you're just discrediting everything they did. The Jets defense showed up and made plays. The Broncos, I just don't trust it after what I saw with the Seahawks against a good team that I kind of compared the Jets and uh, Seahawks with. So I'm going with the Jets on that game. The Jets are a seven-point favorite here. I, I like Broncos plus seven, but I think the Jets are going to pull this out. Um, I think there is going to be maybe a little – their defense is going to stay stay what it was, basically. Um, the offense is just going to die out, though. You're not going to see 26 points from yeah. Bonix. Come on. Yeah, no. um, Eagles-Bucks, rematch of the 21 divisional round. I think. I mean, I, I love what I saw from the Buccaneers beating the Lions. Talk about a playoff rematch. I think the Buccaneers are going to do it again to the Eagles like they did after what I saw from the Eagles. I'm a little bit worried. If AJ Brown's back, though, I might switch, but I think the Buccaneers come back and they're like, hold on, why did we just lose last week yeah. to Bo Nix? And, and they take the win there. I'm going with you. Big bounce back spot here. I love mm -hmm. this spot for him. Bengals Panthers, the Andy Dalton revenge game. <laughs> Bengals, <laughs> Panthers. I mean, I, if the if the Bengals are zero and three, 
why why not the Panthers? Why not the Panthers? If the Bengals are 0 3 and have lost two games to the Patriots and now the Commanders, I mean, if you're looking for a value bet, why not throw your money at the wall? I'm going Panthers, but I just can't in good conscience vote Andy Dalton over Joe Burrow. So I got to go Bengals at the end of the day. Yeah, I really, really, really want to. Like my heart of hearts is telling me, just do it. Just just say Andy Dalton, say it. But I can't do it this time. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm going Panthers as well. Jags, Texans, uh, divisional matchup here. Weird matchup. I think, I'm trying to think of the curses here because there's a cyclical curse with the AFC South teams. I think the Jags always beat the Texans in Houston. So I'm going Interesting. Jags. Okay. I think. I'm not 100% sure. I mean, okay, so the Jags, though, I just said I like an 0-3 Bengals team. I don't like an 0-3 Jags team. So I think I'm going <laughs> Texans for that reason only. They're getting their butts stomped right now by the Bills. I think the Texans get back on track here after running into the buzzsaw that's the Vikings uh, last yeah. last week. I hope nobody listens to that actual advice that I gave. I, I'm not even 100% sure if that's true. Um, Commanders Cardinals in Arizona. I think this is where the Cardinals again remind us uh, that they're going to be frisky this year. They're going to hover around 500. They're going to move to two and two after that game, even if the commanders win and pull off a victory against the Bengals. I'm going with Arizona in that one. I think you're going to see a blowout, uh, a very mm -hmm. high scoring. I think it's going to be Cardinals big blowout here. I love um, it. Just cause the commander's defense just gives me nothing. They give me absolutely nothing. They're giving uh, something tonight though. Apparently they are. That's true. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Pat's 49ers, the Tom Brady bowl, kind of Tom Brady bowl. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we got, we got it. Yeah. You see, it kind of is. Can, can we get a return of Tom Brady? At the, maybe he's calling this game. Who knows? But, oh, um, that'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. <laughs> that'd be awesome. But I got to take the 49ers. I mean, just like I said, they're, they're the, going to be the worst team you want to see healthy or not. Uh, Kyle Shanahan can out scheme anyone and the Patriots, unfortunately, are still getting their footing, but they've looked good. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's close. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with the Niners. It just it just makes way too much sense. That 10.5 points, though, looks juicy for uh, for the Pats, though, I will Yo, say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Browns-Raiders, just what a horrible game. Color matchup. I don't love the color matchup. Oh, yeah. Ugh. No. I don't <laughs> – see, I'm looking at the spreads now, too. Minus one to Vegas right now. <laughs> I I mean, sure, but – after what I just heard in the in the news from their head coach, I mean, why not a Browns bounce back game where they just like it's kind of like that Jaguars win, like it's just ugly and they just win it. Um, but we can rely on the good players being good. Miles Garrett's going to be great, Max Cosby's going to be great, but that's going to be the storyline. Uh, so I'm going to take uh, the Browns on that one. Can they move this game to like June so we can like have a football game in June? You know, when we're like desperate for it. Well, this, this is what you just June. said. You know what I mean? You just said you don't want to have too many good games. So this is your bad. <laughs> at 1 o'clock, go do something else. Well, for you, at 425, do something else. During, during that oh, I can't do game. that. I, I yeah. will be sick if I do anything besides yeah. watch football on a Sunday. <laughs> you can ask you my girlfriend. Me. She'll she'll get mad at me. Uh, <laughs> I'm with she, you. She me. hates football. Just She loves it, but she also hates it. She'll be like, I uh, it's coming back. Like I was literally giving her daily reminders. Um, <laughs> and she was like, 10 day uh, countdown football. but then Nine she gets excited countdown. then like the day of she's like i love she's like i get excited there's food it's it's like fun you know so she she has a love-hate relationship with it that's the best way to exactly that's that's a casual fans relationship with football i i've seen that through all my friends and family as well yeah um chiefs chargers i don't even know if if herbert's gonna play this game if he's not playing it's easy chiefs if he is playing I think the Chiefs are going to play their fourth close game, you know, of the season. And I think they're just going to win it out. I think hardball is going to get a lot of hype. This is on a, a good time in the afternoon, maybe game of the week, as they call it. Um, but I think I'm going to go with the Chiefs if Herbert's out. Even if Herbert's there, I think the Chiefs have what you need to win that game, especially at Arrowhead. Yeah, it's just really hard for me to pick against the Chiefs at Arrowhead, even in a divisional yeah. game. It's really difficult. Exactly. Um, Again, that eight points, though, looks really good. There's a lot of big lines, uh, yeah. you know, coming weeks. Um, the Sunday night game, Bills-Ravens. This is this is a good early – this is a good early game, you know. Um, this is so good. This is going to be well. really good. I, I think I think the Bills come in and, and beat the Ravens here. I think, I think they do. I think they go to Baltimore and say, 
We're going to go to the NFC AFC championship next this year for you guys. Don't worry. We'll go take care of the chiefs as they've just looked better than anyone could have expected. I thought they were going to take a step back and they're kicking butt right now. And the Ravens looked good, but that was just one game against the Cowboys who kind of look uh, underwhelming right now. So I'm going to go bills. Yeah, I, I, I'm loving the bills here, man. I'm, I think this is especially like a, a step back spot for the Ravens as well. Like that win was not convincing. I don't think that was a very convincing win for Ravens fans. I've talked to Ravens fans. They've said, eh, uh, you know, we, I mean, we almost blew a massive lead. What's there to be happy about there? Although you did win. Um, so yeah, I like the bills, uh, Titans, Dolphins. We're getting another Titans, Dolphins on Monday night. Weird. (laughs) I mean, Titans, Dolphins. I don't feel good about either. So I'm going to take the Titans because they have a healthy quarterback, even though that healthy quarterback I'm not convinced about. So I think the Titans finally get a dub here against a banged up Dolphins team. Yeah. I, uh, you just can't pick the Dolphins. I mean, there's the, he, they're so bad. The quarterback situation is so horrible and no. it's a quarterback league. That's it. They're so relying on Tua. And I, I mean, it's props to Tua. That's how good he is in that system. And I think they are consistent with them. And it's just unfortunate, you know, with his injury history and yeah. what the outlook is. And then Seahawks lions in Detroit. Detroit's having a lot of home games to start. I feel like Detroit oh, yeah. and Dallas are starting out at home like a lot. This yeah. Year. They're trying to bank on that good energy that's coming out of Detroit, even though they're out there stalking their head coach to the point where he has to move family homes. Way to ruin a good thing, Detroit fans, if you're listening. Way to ruin a good thing. I know it's not you guys, but, you know, whoever's doing that, you're ruining it for everyone. But here's the thing to know. The Seahawks did go to Ford Field and beat the Detroit Lions, I think, two years ago. So they're not scared to go into Detroit. And we haven't seen the Seahawks be scared yet this year. I'm picking an upset pick. I know it's looking like a two and one to three and out kind of team. So you want to take the Lions, but the Lions haven't convincingly beat anyone. And the Seahawks have an efficient offense mixed with a good defense now. I might I might be a homer here, but I'm gonna take the Hawks. Three and oh, the Seahawks being four and oh after a Monday night. I game. know it's weird to say. It's weird to say. I don't know if I can I don't know if I can sell myself on that. I feel like it's gotta be Detroit, especially in Detroit. They, they've looked a, a lack, not lackluster, but in comparison, I think, to last year, they've looked a little lackluster. They got to find their footing at some point. I think this would be it. It's going to be close, though. I think it's going to be a very close game. This is going to be the one to watch. Nobody should even touch Titans Dolphins. No, no. one should ever touch that. It's it's the perfect doubleheader Monday night, even though, like you said on schedule, I hate that as well. Like, I can't believe yeah. there's two games, like, at the same time on Monday. But, yeah, I'm not even going to switch to the channel, to the Titans-Dolphins. I'm going to have to watch the tape or, like, the three or four memes that get made out of that game. So, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, before we get out of here, because that's all the games, give me your AFC and NFC champion and your Super Bowl pick. Ooh. That's I a know great it's early. question. That's a great question. I had one earlier before the season and now i feel like i'm already changing so sorry to all my fans that have heard whatever i it's a development said. it's a development it's a development it's, it's a development okay i think right now out of the nfc i think the lions are still good i think they're gonna go to the nfc and win the nfc championship i think this is their time especially with how banged up the nfc west teams are and the seahawks i yeah. love them but i just can't put them above like you said they might beat them this week upcoming but I don't know in the long term. So I'm going to take out of the NFC, the Lions, and then out of the AFC, talk about anybody's game. Nope, it's the Chiefs. The Chiefs are easily winning that conference. I mean, that's just how it's going to be. I think I would really love for the bracket to somehow land with the Bills and Chiefs going in the AFC championship, but I know they like to get those games somehow seed-wise out of the way early for all of us. But I think Chiefs, uh, Lions, like what it should have been last year, if you really think about it is what we're going to get. And I mean, why not a three peat? So that's what I'm going to take on the Super Bowl with the chiefs there. So. Wow. Wow. Three peat. Wow. All right. Well, thanks for coming on Griffin. This was awesome. We had a great time. I know we did run about 20 minutes long. It always happens. I I always just get lost in the, in in the, in the conversation, but that's a good thing. Um, Thank you for coming on, man. All the listeners, if you're still listening by now, go check out uh, stuff about sports. Is that correct? Or show about sports. I'm sorry. Show about show sports, about yeah, sports. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on Apple, Spotify, um, anywhere you can get your podcasts. Yeah. Soon to be YouTube, hopefully. Get that. <laughs> got to push on you. Um, exactly. 
And uh, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and we will see you on Wednesday. Appreciate you all. Thank you, Alex, as always. This is awesome.